Welcome, Michael. Hi, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> nice to uh, see you in person. Yeah. Virtual person. <laughs> <laughs> as good as we can get right now, huh? Yes. <laughs> mm. Um, just so that you know, Johanna, when I joined, there was like a robot voice that told me the meeting was being recorded. So I'm assuming everyone will maybe get that notification. Okay, great. Um, yeah, our, our moderator will also uh, announce it. Um, mm -hmm. I think your music is very nice and appropriate, Johanna. I thought it would help people gently wake up this morning. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. It almost sounds like my alarm. <laughs> Just to let you know that uh, I'm admitting people as they show up on my screen. And just to let you know that your audio is heard by everybody. Yes, thanks, Barbara. me, Johanna, Barbara. Nice to see you, Barbara. Ed, there you go. I recognize you. I'm seeing that we're oh, zipping so. through the... Um, slides. Who else do we have? Sherry, hi. Pardon me for greeting her like an old friend, but that's something that she's more important than anybody else in the group. I'm an experienced teacher, I know. I shouldn't make anybody feel more special. <laughs> Michael, do I pronounce your last name Ergen? You're on mute. Uh, it's pronounced Ugrin. Ugrin, thank you. Yeah, thanks thank for asking. Thank you. People look at my name and think, oh my goodness. <laughs> So I'm used to being mispronounced. How do I pronounce your last name? 
hot. It's just like taut with an H, but it looks scarier. <laughs> okay. And then Kevin Vanda, Vanda Wedge, Vanda Wig. Kevin is on mute. Morning. Good morning. How do I pronounce your last name? Oh, it doesn't matter to me. Van de Weg is how I say it, but it doesn't, I don't care. Van de Weg, well, it mattered to your dad. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just getting my kids to spell it right. They spell it different. So I'm like, ah. <laughs> Good morning, oh, Kevin. yeah. My name is, is a Dutch name. Uh, is a Dutch name that the English decided how we would spell it <laughs> after we came to America. So, and we have... Leanne Hua. Oh, listen, I am getting lots of people coming in now. Are these <clears throat> guests or speakers? Joanna? Everyone is a guest unless I've made you a co-host. So the people in black, I am not going to be introducing. True? Yes, that's true. Just the uh, speakers who are okay. um, we have the who are in the um, schedule. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to natter a little bit. I am just absolutely stunned at the wonderful job that has been done by the People's Voice on Climate um, and all of you, really, for uh, suiting up and showing up on Friday morning to do this. If nothing else, we'll have a better understanding and knowledge of what we're going forward with. And I think it's always fun to work with people. So donate your questions for the belonging. I'm sorry, uh, there was something in the chat and maybe Joanna, you can see what that was. Sure. Mm. I, think, I think we've taken care of all the chat. Well, I'm still on screen share, so I would appreciate if there's anything now, but you can also tell me when it's time for me to close the screen share. And you can close the screen share now. We're going to leave chat open um, during our session, and we're going to have people put their Shoot. questions in the Q&A. And do you have a Q&A at the bottom of your... I've lost a screen. Oh, that was probably me. Um, I stopped. I had to. Cl I closed my window. All right, you're still screen sharing. I don't know. I. 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 Uh, I. I. I am. Huh. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's up at the top. But uh, it's sort of like looking in people's, you know, back room or something. Like, oh, that's what she's doing. <laughs> Does this get? Barbara, rid of I can. I can take over screen sharing. I just have sort of a. a basic introductory slide that Johanna can talk over, if that's helpful. Uh, thank you. And then maybe once you take it over, then you can give it back to Johanna if you want. Or Sounds good. Now. Sorry. Great. Um, but actually, Barbara, if you could just um, stop screen sharing, then I can go back to the regular um, introduction. Yes, as a regular presentation. I understand this. Um, there we go. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> We're at 8.02. Are we ready to go? I think we are. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, Welcome. Welcome to... Oops. I think we're ready to go. I heard, I heard somebody. Um, I am uh, Lunell Hot, on, and I'm the president of the League of Women Voters. And on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Washington and the People's Voice on Climate, I'd like to welcome everyone here 
to this virtual brown bag event, the Washington Climate Assembly, Washington Speaks. Our objective today is to provide you with an overview of the so-called Citizens or People's Assembly and an introduction to the work that has been taking place here in Washington State in the last two months. We'll be recording this session. As I said, I'm Lunell Hot, and I've been a good government groupie all through my life since high school. I've been on a county plan commission. I've been a county parks board member, the state recreation conservation office, grant committee, an organizer of the Inland Northwest Trails Coalition, and my own consulting practice. And I teach in the master's and doctoral level for Gonzaga University. And no, I cannot get you tickets. <laughs> the point here is not what we have done and who we have been, but really where we are going and what we plan to do. I'm here today to support a community and fact-based method to provide public policy leaders such as yourself with a method that addresses the league's most fundamental interest and informed democracy. I'm honored to be here to facilitate this process. I'd like to start off by acknowledging that we, the people of Washington State live and work on traditional lands of the indigenous people who have been here since time immemorial. There are 29 federally recognized tribes and seven non-federally recognized tribes within the boundaries of Washington State. Tribes and tribal people, thousands of years of traditional knowledge to our present moments. Tribes bring important and vital voices to the current conversation and we honor our tribal relations. As many of you know, a climate assembly is a democratic process that seeks to answer a question or solve a problem facing a community by bringing a representative sample of the community together. By learning about the problem as well as each other's needs and concerns, they can arrive at proposals that fairly represent the interests of all people in the community. Assemblies have been used worldwide to help shape the work of governments. This assembly was initiated by the nonprofit group People's Voice for, on Climate to center around the problem of climate pollution mitigation. Members learned about the problem from experts and interested parties discussed the problem and potential solutions with one another and will be making recommendations about what should happen legislatively. Today, you will hear from the following speakers, Laura Berry, who will be providing a brief overview on the Citizens Assembly model. We'll hear from members of the legislature who have provided their support for the Washington Climate Assembly process and are interested in exploring the Climate Assembly's recommendations. This is really very important because you can do all of this stuff, but if the legislature doesn't say so what and move forward with it, then uh, that it really is a cul-de-sac instead of a road. And we're, that's why we're so happy that you're with us this morning and we hope you have a good brown bag. Darren Jones, MP, a member of the United Kingdom Parliament will speak from the perspective of a legislator about how a similar process in the UK was, has provided proposals that have assisted the development of climate policies in the United Kingdom. Mike Chang will discuss the process the assembly members have been going through in the past two months and where it is now. Mike is an associate with the Cascadia Consulting Group and is a member of the coordinating team which ran the assembly. Three members of the university research team, Tool Park, John Roundtree, and Katerina Nori, have been conducting real-time analysis of the assembly using surveys and observation will report on what they have learned about members' experiences thus far. Finally, we we'll use the rest of our time to answer any questions that you'll have about the Washington Climate Assembly and how its recommendations can be meaningful to your work. And I just wanna say that I'm in one of those places that you hear about in the legislature that has really intermittent Wi-Fi. So, so if I sound like I'm talking over someone, I'm really not that rude. It's just because there's a lag. So with your forgiveness, let's get right to the first presenter. Laura Berry is the research and policy director for the climate mobilization and a member of the monitoring team, which has been overseeing for the Washington Climate Assembly to ensure that it's organized in a fair and credible way. Laura, let's hear from you. Great. Thank you so much, Linnell. Um, thank you, everyone. So um, as Linnell said, I am a member of the monitoring team and actually someone who's been working with People's Voice on Climate for 
uh, quite a while since sort of almost the beginning of this, uh, this idea of bringing a climate assembly to Washington State. Um, so a little bit about my background. Um, I did my, my graduate research actually on deliberative democracy and the role of citizens in environmental decision making. And I'm really passionate uh, in my role both at the climate mobilization and on the monitoring team to sort of bring you know, the promise of deliberative democracy to the American climate policy conversation, which it's, it's you know, not quite as uh, significant over here as it is in other places around the world. Um, and it's really exciting to have been part of this process to see Washington State run the first climate assembly. So I've been asked just to give sort of an, uh, a short overview of the process and the model of climate assemblies. Uh, this slideshow is uh, from resources from a group called People Powered. Um, I'll drop the link in the chat to the website that, so you can look uh, for more resources, but this is just gonna be a short overview. There's going to be more detail about the actual Washington State Climate Assembly process in later presentations. So what is a climate assembly? Um, so a climate assembly is one of a number of sort of deliberative democratic innovations that are really designed to go above and beyond sort of typical methods of inviting citizens or inviting individuals to uh, participate in the climate or in any policy making process. So things like, uh, you know, surveys or asking people to give public comment on a specific policy or regulatory decision. But really what it is, is a mini public. So a group of individuals who are demographically representative of a specific population, in this case, Washington State, um, that are convened specifically for a purpose, which is to hear testimony from experts, from groups, uh, you know, in interested parties in a specific issue, and then deliberate on that issue while being given the resources that they need to really dedicate time and effort and energy to understanding that problem then deliberating for a certain amount of time and presenting recommendations to a government body or a, a group that is going to then carry them forward. So in this case, you know, this demographically representative group is usually selected by a method called sortition, which is random se selection. So this is in sort of a, a different approach than selecting groups of individuals based on their interests or electing a group of individuals to make a decision, but really is uh, designed to reach people from all walks of life to bring together their you know, diverse experiences, a diverse group of people across different dem demographics, different opinions, different backgrounds from education to income level to race, et cetera. Um, and really to give them the process and the tools that they need to dive into a specific complex policy issue, in this case, climate change. So I mentioned a little bit about expert support. So this process usually takes place over a certain number of days or a certain number of sessions. So individuals are provided you know, expert support and information throughout uh, the learning phase of a, an assembly. So people are gathered together and provided information. Uh, they hear present presentations from expert groups, from expert uh, presenters, academics, et cetera. Uh, on a specific issue, and they're facilitated by professionals, so groups who are, uh, you know, a charged or hired to provide this facilitation process, in this case, it's the coordinating team, um, to ensure that those voices from, from across the assembly diverse range of, of views across the spectrum of information, but that is, you know, balanced, clear and comprehensive information is being given to these assembly participants. And so, you know, climate assemblies uh, involve kind of a, a wide range of actors. So in the, in the case of climate change, in the case of climate assemblies, some of the actors have included climate and environmental organizations. So groups like uh, the one that I work for, an advocacy group on climate change, the League of Women Voters, uh, et cetera. You know, community organizations um, and tribes and tribal groups, uh, government champions like yourselves, folks who are, are deeply involved in the actual policy making process, who are interested and invested in what the actual assembly process is, is going through. Um, and then experts, you know, in the actual science, in this case, uh, climate scientists who provide that baseline information for people to make their, their judgments, their deliberations and their recommendations on. So, uh, you know, Linnell spoke briefly to the current state of climate assemblies, but there's quite a number of climate assembly processes that have either already happened 
and or are in progress right now. So we'll hear a little bit more about the, the UK climate assembly. There has also been you know, a climate uh, citizens convention uh, on climate change in France, um, uh, others in, in Poland. Uh, there's currently one happening nationally at, at the uh, Scottish Climate Assembly, specifically in Scotland, that has a lot of similarities to the Washington State Climate Assembly. But there have also been local climate assemblies. So this is really a deliberative sort of tool to understand what specific issues, uh, you know, and concentrate sort of it, both local questions and ideas about climate change all the way up to the national level. And so this is a tool that really can be applied at different, at different levels and, and across different groups. Um, yep. So this is sort of the most important slide I would say for this conversation, but ultimately when used and designed well, climate assemblies can actually make a huge difference in a complex policy making process. Um, you know, a, a couple of ways that we've seen throughout the research and also just sort of in practice is that climate assemblies really can help overcome partisan divides that are preventing action from being taken. You know, climate change is and continues to be an incredibly difficult issue uh, politically. And so climate assemblies really show that when bringing together a group of people from diverse backgrounds that, that people can actually come together and, and have recommendations that they come to close to consensus on after you know, a period of deliberation. Um, it does help people think about sort of the longer term especially when it comes to the well-being of the community, how this issue is going to affect them, and then also of, of the state, in this case, rather than country. Um, it does also inspire new ideas and commitments uh, and more ambitious action in many cases. So this really goes beyond sort of what the political you know, um, business as usual is on, on the spectrum of what solutions might be, uh, might be possible, might be politically possible. It gives also people who are most impacted by climate change the power to act. You know, there are disproportionately impacted communities um, when it comes to climate change across the United States and in Washington state. And oftentimes it's those communities that don't have a voice in the policy making process as well. Um, and then finally, shifting public opinion. You know, climate assemblies really demonstrate that, and other citizens assemblies demonstrate that when people are brought together and given the resources and the time, it is actually possible to, you know, get a better understanding of what people actually think, which then influences the general public as a whole. Um, so that is just about it in terms of information for me. And I think I'm at time. So I will pass it back to Johanna. Thank you very much. It's actually going to toss it back to me because I get to introduce some of the legislators who are with us this morning. And I think Judy Warnick, Senator Warnick is somewhere on the screen. I'm here. And if she doesn't pop up. Here. Oh, I'm there here. you are. Okay. Yeah. And I am so glad we have that- six of you, two coming late. So let's start with you. <laughs> okay, okay. And I will just make a real quick comment. This is a, a very interesting topic. I um, have enjoyed uh, the little interaction I have already had with the Climate Assembly. For, for everyone's information, I represent, uh, uh, I'm the Senator for the 13th Legislative District, uh, which includes Kittitas County, uh, most of Grant County, Lincoln County, and a little bit of Yakima County. Um, and I serve on the Ag and Natural Resources, Water and Parks Committee. So this is a, a strong interest to me. And unfortunately, I cannot stay past 8.30 today. Um, I had a previous uh, engagement, and, but I, I know there's others on the, on the uh, call and one of our staff people are on this taking notes. So I'm um, glad to be here and so glad to see so many faces this morning. So thank you very much for putting this together. Thank you. You know, we're all like trying to change a tire on a moving truck. So we really <laughs> understand the schedule thing. We're grateful for the people who are here. Yeah. Senator Leas is next, if I can see him. Not seeing Senator Leas. Representative Dent. Well, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I've never heard that term before, changing a tire on a moving truck. I like that. <laughs> I think I'll keep that and use that. Uh, anyway, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you at the beginning for inviting me to um, 
to participate. I, I haven't participated very much because it's begun to happen when our schedules, um, you know, increase to the point we just didn't have time. And, and I like uh, Senator Warren, I have to leave a little bit early too this morning because of just uh, prior commitments. But I do serve the 13th legislative district which uh, uh, Senator Warnick is my seatmate, uh, Kittitas, Grant, McKinnon, part of Yakima counties. And uh, you know, we have a, quite a different geography over here than, than is on the west side. And our entire district is different from one into the other, from the mountains of Kittitas, the mountains and valleys of Kittitas County to the, to the pure desert of Grant County that we represent uh, and on into a little more moderate area of Lincoln County. So we really do see it all. And, and I've lived here since... Uh, 1955. Uh, I've seen things change. I've seen things moderate, and I have a pretty good handle on, uh, on what happens. Uh, I, I would like to spend more time with all of you folks. So when we're not uh, doing this session thing, and whether there be more time to sit and, and talk and and really get into the um, into the subject at hand, because uh, it's something that uh, we do we do need to discuss, and, and I understand that. So anyway, again, thank you for having me and. Uh, I do appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to say a few words this morning. So um, good luck and looking forward to, uh, to having a little more time here in the future real soon. Thank you. Thanks very much. Do we have Representative Harris Talley on the screen? And good morning. Hello. There you are. Hi. Good morning. Thank you all for um, assembling us to hear about this assembly. I'm Representative Kirsten Harris Talley. She, her pronouns, and I represent the 37th Legislative District, one of the newest additions to our Women of Color delegation here. And we serve Renton, Skyway, and Southeast Seattle. Uh, we're a hyper urban district. Uh, climate change is a, a big concern to my neighbors here. We also have some of the worst air quality, soil quality, um, and water quality in the state, in part our proximity to some of the airfields here within SeaTac Airport, as well as two Boeing fields, but also because of the legacies of unfortunately some you know, racially uh, centered policy like redlining that forced a lot of residents to be near um, early industry and other things. So this conversation's important. I come from activism circles and really appreciate these types of democratic processes that let community have voice. I think when community and decision makers work together, that's when we have the best policy with the highest return. So um, appreciate all this work and look forward to hearing more about what the assembly is bringing forward. And I also serve in the house on the energy and environment committee. So look forward to bringing some of your thoughts to our continued discussions there. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Representative Ryu might be with us. Looking for a screen to light up. She thought that she would be after 830, but I just thought I would check. Um, do we have Senator Leas with us yet? And Representative Ramel was also going to be with us. And I am thrilled to see the other representatives and senators in the room. This is, this is really fabulous. Thank you so much. Darren Jones, MP, is the labor member of the UK Parliament for Bristol Northwest and the chairman of the House of Commons Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy Committee. He also sits on the Joint Committee on the National Security Strategy and the Liaison Committee, which oversees the work of the Prime Minister. Now there's a job. Um, the Business, Energy, and Industrial Strategy Committee acted as the lead House of Commons committee in commissioning the UK's Climate Change Citizens Assembly, and it continues to champion the Assembly's work and conclusions in the UK Parliament. This is oh. Darren Jones. Thank you um, so much for the uh, introduction and the invitation to be with you today. Um, I'm a huge advocate for citizens assemblies, especially in the climate space, uh, and so delighted to be speaking on behalf of the British Parliament today about our experiences. Um, I have a few slides, uh, which all being well, I will be able to um, share with you. And then um, if time permits, happy to take any questions that you, uh, that you might have. Um, 
So as was said in the introduction, my committee, which scrutinizes the work of the Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy Committee um, in Westminster, was the lead um, uh, commissioner for Climate Assembly UK, uh, which was looking at how we can reach um, our net zero target. So we have a statutory target at country level to reach net zero carbon emissions by 2050. And the Citizens Assembly was looking to um, find pathways of agreement with the public on how we would get there. Um, it's the first time we've ever done a UK-wide Citizens Assembly in the UK, um, and it had 108 Assembly members, which was representative of our country of around 66 million people, um, and was commissioned through, as I mentioned earlier, a process called sortition or a civic lottery. I did suggest to some of the members, or I asked them whether it was a bit like receiving a golden ticket to Willy Wonka's chocolate factory when the letter came through the post, and it was probably a um, uh, description of the fact that some of them thought it was a scam getting a letter from the British Parliament, which I think shows that we have more to do in this um, uh, directive democracy process so that people really feel invited uh, to be part of decision making. Um, the group of 108 people uh, ranged from 16 year olds all the way to, I think the eldest was uh, 78, um, across all of the obvious demographics and parts of the country, including people who were um, passionate advocates for climate change action, as well as people who were skeptical about climate change in the first place. Uh, it took place over six weekends, uh, latterly online because of the COVID pandemic, and involved a number of speakers who were um, selected based on their um, independent expertise um, across a whole range of issues. And we produced two reports, an interim one in June 2020, and the final report last September. I think the interesting question is, well, what impact does this have? It's an expensive and complicated process to do it at country level. And so you obviously want to make sure that you're getting value for money. Um, as you can see from some of the stats on the slide here, we've had very significant engagement across the country through all uh, kind of um, major communications channels, which has in many ways brought the public with us more broadly on the climate change discussion, but also highlighted to the public the commitment of our government and parliament to reach net zero by 2050, and that we're trying to put the work in to explain what that looks like for people. Um, we hosted the event in um, Port Calais South, which is part of the parliamentary estate in uh, Westminster, um, and the report was received also by the Prime Minister, uh, and I led a debate on the floor of the House of Commons, uh, as well as leading scrutiny of it through my select committee and through other departmental committees in the House of Commons. Um, there's a point here which is of interest perhaps. We, we, had, we, we went through a series of more frequent elections than we might normally have over the past few years, which meant that a number of legislators changed um, uh, and the uh, Citizens Assembly UK noted that you need to get legislators with buy-in irrespective of office or position to ensure some kind of continuity, because um, often these things can run over electoral timescales and obviously you want to ensure that the decisions or conclusions aren't affected by uh, political, often shorter timescales. Uh, we've, the the um, substantive report, which was very significant, has also been used as a really important evidence base, as well as a democratic process. It's been used for briefing across officials, over 400 across different departments, whether it's transport, education, energy, treasury, um, to inform their work, and had been built in as a reference point into the UK's energy white paper, which is a significant policy recently announced on how we plan to decarbonise the economy. Uh, there are two references here to two um, ministers, um, Alex Sharma, who was the relevant Secretary of State but is now our President for COP26 when we host the UN Climate Summit this November in Glasgow in Scotland, and his successor Kwasi Kwarteng, who is the new Secretary of State responsible, who have just highlighted this work formally as part of their considerations in the executive branch, uh, but also in the Prime Minister's 10-point plan for a green industrial revolution. Um, it's also been used by lots of other stakeholders. Um, from a committee perspective where I sit chairing the Base Select Committee, um, it forms a, a standing piece of evidence for all of our inquiry works that are related to decarbonisation and is a really helpful way for us to know that we can refer to what the public think based on uh, a confident assessment through the Climate Assembly to inform our deliberations without having to either have to replicate the process, commission polling, 
or to take anecdotal evidence from our jobs as representatives of particular constituencies. It's a really strong way to give you a national view with a legitimate set of conclusions that can adequately represent what the public think on these issues. Uh, one organisation that I would just call out is the Climate Change Committee, which is a non-governmental organisation which serves a statutory purpose in the UK, uh, based of experts who need to advise the government on how we reach our carbon budgets. And they tell us how we're doing uh, and give us a carbon budget each year to show our progress. And they've then used the Climate Assembly report also as part of their assessment and recommendations to government. So they recently produced the sixth carbon budget here in the UK, which included a number of routes to net zero by our 2050 target, um, and their independent expert assessments was, were entwined with the conclusions of the Citizens' Assembly. Um, the Assembly members themselves um, really enjoyed the process, uh, and I think it was a new and novel way, especially at a time when many people feel that political decisions can be a bit disconnected from their day-to-day -day lives, to show that they were really front and central in making these deliberations and coming to sometimes difficult conclusions on some of the behavioural choices or lifestyle choices we're going to have to consider as part of the net zero transition. Um, and as you can see, they were all very pleased with the, um, with the outcome. And then there's now further work that has to flow off the back of this as well. So this was um, a substantive piece of work that looked a whole range of issues. Um, and I don't know if the link um, I can arrange to have the link sent to you. It should have been on that last slide. So you can look at the detail if you wish. Um, but there are, in terms of behavioral change, in terms of the detailed implementation, in terms of how you get the right level of government uh, governance for decision-making and implementation at regional and local level, um, it shows that we can build on the Citizens Assembly UK conclusions. It's not a one-off document that sits on the shelf, but becomes a foundation um, for our deliberations and uh, delivery of our net zero target here. Um, in the UK. Um, and I will stop showing my slides at that stage. Um, and um, if the agenda allows, and if anybody has any questions, I'll be delighted to try to answer them. We're going to try and take them at the end. So if you can stay with us, um, that would be no great. Problem. Where are you physically? We all want to know. Oh, I'm in London. And thankfully, after months and months of greyness, the sun is starting ah. to come out, uh, which is good news. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I know you're nine hours different. My children lived in London. We have next Mike Chang, who is a member of the coordinating team for the Washington Climate Assembly. He's an enthusiastic proponent of inclusive participatory planning processes and brings ex <clears throat> pardon me, expertise in community engagement and facilitation, strategic planning, climate vulnerability assessments, and climate action planning. He has led and facilitated multiple climate planning processes over his career, including with the Macaw Tribe, City of Port Angeles, Kitsap County, City of Edmond, City of Redmond, and City of San Francisco. He knows us well. Mike? Great, thank you. So thank, thank you everyone for coming today to our elected officials, to People's Voices on Climate, um, to Lindell for facilitating. Um, thank you to Laura and Darren for providing the overview of the Climate Assembly um, and an example from the UK Climate Assembly. So I'll now transition and provide um, some context and the overview of the Washington Climate Assembly, where we've been and where we are now and where we're heading. Um, so I'll just start. So the Assembly uh, member and the Climate Assembly here in Washington State is addressing this question. How can Washington State equitably design and implement climate mitigation strategies while strengthening communities disproportionately impacted by climate change across the state. Um, so the process to develop this question included developing a scoping workshop that we held in early October of last year, as well as a feedback process to solicit input from elected officials, other experts, and interested parties across the state. In addition to that, um, we also wanted to touch upon the actual membership of the Washington Climate Assembly. So we had a very robust member selection process and we just wanted to highlight that um, as stated by Laura and by Darren, um, the Washington Climate Assembly is a microcosm of Washington state. Uh, the membership is representative of its demographics considering age, gender, race and ethnicity, income levels, geography, education levels and congressional districts, as well as their political views, which includes their stances on climate change and its causes. 
In the first part of the climate assembly, we had the learning sessions where we learned uh, and heard from almost 50 speakers. And these speakers included renowned climate scientists who've authored multiple IPCC reports and national climate assessments to technical experts working in the transportation, energy, utilities, carbon pricing, and economics fields, as well as practitioners such as local government officials or other technical experts. Um, such as energy and utility providers, tribal staff and leaders, as well as local organizations and residents of Washington state with lived experiences on climate change. Over the past few weeks, we have transitioned from the learning sessions to the deliberative sessions, where the focus is on the assembly members taking agency and developing recommendations. They've considered all of the recommendations that the presenters have offered during the learning sessions, as well as identified new and emerging recommendations. And so where we, where we are currently is we're actually in our home stretch. We're finishing our public comment period today and the assembly will be considering and responding to all of the public comments tomorrow. In addition to doing that tomorrow, the assembly members will also vote on the final recommendations. So this is where we are and where we're heading is, uh, we just wanna let you all know is that uh, within the following week, we will send out the final recommendations um, to uh, the monitoring team, to people's voices on climate and to all of you, and as well as to all of our other experts, interested parties and presenters. Following these final recommendations, uh, we'll work on a final report, um, which will be rolled out in the next few weeks. Um, those are, uh, just wanted to keep it short, sweet. I didn't have any PowerPoint slides. And in our virtual world, I like seeing faces more. <laughs> I've been staring at screens for a year now. So thank you um, all for your time. And I'm looking forward to uh, your questions and further discussion in a bit. Well, it looks like you're sort of on another planet. So <laughs> thank you, Mike. That's a, that's a good overview. I see um, now that we have Representative Ramel who has joined us. And if you want to give a shout out to your colleagues, thanks for being able to join us. We'll take a few words from you. Oh, well, I, I appreciate it. Um, sorry, I was late. Um, and I'm, I'm Glad to see so many of my colleagues here in the room today. Um, I was excited to hear what the assembly has been up to. Um, and I'm, I'm eager to, to kind of see where the conclu what conclusions uh, folks come up with. And I, I think it's an innovative and kind of an exciting way to gather input from people around the state um, as we work together to keep confronting our climate crisis. So thanks for, uh, thanks for organizing this very early brown bag lunch uh, this morning. Oh, and thanks. thanks. Thanks for being part of it. And I also see that Representative Ryu has been able to join us coming from something to something else. Would you like to say a few words? Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, definitely, Representative Ramel is a uh, huge advocate for the work that you're doing for a good reason, because he's in the, in the thick of many bills uh, addressing climate change head on. Uh, I am Cindy Ryu, state rep in the 32nd LD, um, a formerly chair of the Housing Veterans Committee, now chair of the Community and Economic Development. And so I don't get to work as much in the climate uh, uh, on the environmental bills, but I do support the work that you are doing. Really appreciate everyone engaged, staying engaged through this uh, way of uh, citizen engagement, because I think that is a huge part of what makes democracy so beautiful. It's not perfect, obviously, but uh, definitely uh, but the part that Representative Rommel and I are engaged in, the representative democracy, you are also engaging in a different way. And so uh, I am very happy that you are uh, all here. And I also see uh, um, other representatives and senators. And so thank you everyone for convening this. Really appreciate it. Thanks very much. And now let's hear, we have a video clip of some of the people who participated in the process. And I think someone's queuing that up now. Um, 
Yes, thank you so much. Uh, let me just um, get that set up really quick. Um, we've heard from uh, assembly, from uh, a member of the coordinating team who talked a little bit about how the assembly members were selected. I thought it would be great for you to be able to hear from them yourself. So um, I'd like to share a little video clip that was played during the member selection process. And, um, and and it reflects some assembly members who were hoping, some community members who were very much hoping that they would be picked to serve on the Washington Climate Assembly. Um, Um, hopefully we will have that in just one moment. Um, and if Zoom is not cooperating, then we may not, we may have to move on to the next piece, but um, I can also share the, from the member selection video with you in the, in the chat. So um, it might not be possible to share this clip at the moment. So we may need to go. I think sharing the link is a great idea. Great, and, thank you so much. Well, I don't know why we expect more of technology than we expect of people. <laughs> but Johanna, I'm, I'm gonna see you. Move on, um, but I will share this clip with you in the, in the chat. Thank you so much. Johanna, I'm gonna see whether it might be a streaming issue on your hand and, and if I can stream it, I will jump, I will present it after the next speaker. Thank you, Barbara. That's great. We have we have presenters who are members of a multidisciplinary research team studying the assembly based out of the University of Arkansas School of Public Service. To evaluate the assembly, the team used an approach developed by Dr. John Gastel to evaluate other citizen participation processes, such as the citizen initiative review. And you're hearing more about that in the legislature and the Oregon Citizens Assembly on COVID-19 recovery. The team gathered data by observing assembly sessions and asking assembly participants to complete surveys. In addition, after the assembly, the team will conduct interviews with selected assembly participants and organizers. The team will then analyze that information and submit an evaluation report to the assembly organizers within three months after the assembly concludes. Here come the three presenters, and you'll be pleased to know I, in Spokane, Washington, am in the sun. <laughs> Let's hear from Chul Hyun Park. Dr. Park, can you raise your hand? An assistant professor at the University of Arkansas. His research interests include open governance, e-government, and citizen participation. He teaches research methods, data analysis, and program evaluation and has previously participated in the evaluation of the Oregon Citizen Assembly on COVID-19 recovery. Dr. Park. Hello, everyone. So, yeah, Dr. Rontree, go ahead. Oh, actually, I was gonna get us started off. Um, well, hello and good morning. Give me just a second to share my screen. Well, thank you While so you're much. you're doing that, John Roundtree is uh, an assistant professor of communication studies at the University of Houston downtown. He conducts research and teaches courses in public deliberation and rhetoric and has previously participated in evaluations of citizens initiative reviews and Oregon Citizen Assembly on COVID-19. And then why don't you just call on people as you're ready to present? That would make good sense. Thank you, Dr. Roundtree. Thank you, and thank you so much for that introduction. Um, as 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 you've said, uh, we are members of the research team, so I'm joined by my colleagues at the University of Arkansas, who uh, you just introduced, Dr. Chul Park, uh, Dr. Robert Richards, and Katarina Nuri, who is a graduate student there. Um, our role really is to try to give an independent evaluation of the climate assembly process uh, based on our expertise in deliberative democracy. And so we're here to give that kind of independent, comprehensive look at what's going on in this process. So as mentioned, um, our research team and methods, we try to use 
a comprehensive slate of methods to get at what's going on in the process. We use both quantitative and qualitative measures. So when it comes to quantitative, uh, we, we give surveys to participants at different intervals throughout the process. So it's not just at the end, it's actually uh, at the beginning and at different stages in the middle to try to understand their experiences throughout the process, uh, what kind of qualitative feedback they have. So we give them a chance to give feedback for the coordinating team and overall how well the deliberation is going. And then we also have qualitative measures. So we've taken hundreds of pages now of observational notes um, as we've sat in on both the plenary and the small group sessions. And we'll be doing interviews with participants after, uh, after the assembly ends to try to better understand their experiences. And as, as has been noted, uh, we've been on evaluation teams before on these kinds of processes led by John Gastel, who's now at Penn State, but he's also worked a lot in Washington and Oregon. Um, so we've been on the evaluation team for the Citizens Initiative Reviews, uh, for the Oregon Citizens Assembly on COVID Recovery, which was also held on Zoom last year, uh, and for the Australian Citizens Parliament. So we've had some experience with these kinds of deliberative processes and trying to provide some evaluation of them. I know we were asked to briefly touch on a comparison, like how well did this assembly do versus the others? And the short version is that we've seen a very similar high quality deliberation in this assembly that we've really come to expect from these kinds of assembly processes and deliberative processes. So we can get into specific points of comparison at the end in the Q and A if y'all want, but that was the overall consensus judgment of the research team when we met earlier this week. And now uh, I wanna turn it over to Katarina because we had some specific data points that we thought would be of interest to you. Katarina. Thank you, Dr. Roundtree. Um, there are two survey questions that measure participants' engagement and investment shown in this graph. Uh, the blue line shows participants' answer to the question, how often did you speak up today compared to other members of the assembly? At the end of the learning session on the left, participants felt on average that they spoke up a bit less often than others. This increased throughout the sessions and last Saturday, participants felt that they spoke up about as often as others. The orange line shows us participants answer to the question, how important a role did you play in today's assembly discussions? We can see that participants originally felt on average that their role was a little important. As this also increased throughout the sessions last Saturday, participants felt on average that their role was moderately important. And, and when we see these increases, this is a good sign of participant engagement and investment. Additionally, uh, we can view participants engagement and investment through their levels of enthusiasm. Um, in, this, in the survey, participants were asked during today's assembly sessions, which of these emotional reactions did you experience, if any? And they were given up to six choices. Enthusiasm, the green line up top, was rated as the top emotion at each of the four sessions where this question was asked. In previous sessions, anxiety, the dotted gray line, was in the top three emotions, but this past session, anxiety dropped to fourth place, and the top three emotions that participants felt on Saturday were enthusiasm, ha happiness, and sympathy. So participants' positive emotional responses have increased. Um, now I will pass it over to Dr. Park. Hello, everyone. I'm going to share our findings about how certain panelists who had different political views and identities, they worked together and discussed the climate change, which is very politically controversial issue, right? So first of all, I'd like to introduce several qualitative comments from citizen panelists. But first, as you can see here, I'd like so glad to see uh, that the participants are willing to bridge political divide. The second, or so that I felt today was very open to the different factions. So as you can see here, we got very positive feedback from the citizen the panelists. And then, so we also, we also asked the citizen panelists the following the survey question. So when other participants expressed the views different from your own, how often did you consider carefully what they said? So according to the result, so more than 85% of the participants reported that they almost always or often so consider other participants different political opinions and views very carefully. 
or so. So additionally, we found that 84% of citizen participants felt that other participants treated themselves with respect during the assembly session. So uh, the Washington Climate Assembly provided an important opportunity for uh, people with different political views and opinions and identities. They all work together in order to find and develop um, collaborative cl climate, collaborative solutions to climate change. This is our finding. Lastly, uh, thank you, thank you for listening. So I'd like to let you know that this is our finding. This is our preliminary findings. So if we want to know our final findings and visual, please feel free to reach out to principal investigator, Dr. Robert Richards. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, this, the research part of this is so important to us. So we really appreciate what, what you have done and what you have presented. We're going to wrap up with Joanna Lundell, who is a member of the People's Voice on Climate. It's the group which initiated the process of the Citizens Assembly. Joanna is a deliberative democracy advocate and writer living on traditional Duwamish land in Seattle, Washington. She has a bachelor's degree in geography from the University of Washington with a minor in international studies. And she's going to cover three points for us as we conclude, and then we'll take questions later. And of course, there will be a follow-up with the chat and we'll send you that link to the citizen voices from the Climate Assembly. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Ronal. And um, I, I had a slide to share, but at this point, I probably shouldn't risk it. <laughs> but um, I ultimately, I, I just wanted to thank you all so much for being here and for learning more about this process. Um, the Climate Assembly is um, a, a project that was initiated by People's Voice on Climate and um, we are just so excited to see what type of recommendations may, may be produced out of this process. And what we wanna ask of members of the legislature is that you, um, is that you pay attention to what comes out of, this, out of this assembly and that you consider these recommendations seriously for future concrete policy proposals and, and take the, this feedback from a representative sample of the Washington state residents and sort of hold that as what Washingtonians across the state might be, you know, would be excited to support if they had the equal opportunity to provide, to be as, as, um, as knowledgeable about the issues as these members of the assembly have been. Um, there's some various ways that we could follow up to find uh, more concrete ways for the uh, members of the legislature to respond to these recommendations, um, such as um, perhaps exploring them in, in different committee groups or um, in discussing them you know, in the time between different legislative sessions. But my, my, my main ask is that you take them seriously and, um, and really explore them and um, hold this sort of informed will of the people uh, to, to, that, um, to that standard and just make the, the work that's gone into um, creating this learning sessions and these deliberative sessions be really meaningful and be really meaningful for the members of the public who have participated in them. Thank you so much. Do you want to go back and talk about what's going to happen to the recommendations, like anything happening tomorrow? Uh, I think that Mike Chang would be the one to talk about that. Um. Yeah, so um, in terms of the recommendations, uh, tomorrow is just the final uh, is the final deliberative session and the final vote for the Climate Assembly members. Um, obviously, uh, after that, we do want to um, uh, make sure we tally everything correctly. As um, you can see on our website, we do have a, a rule book that's been guiding us um, and setting parameters on every step of the way of the process. And so there are specific uh, thresholds and um, 
and levels of agreement that do need to be achieved for something to be elevated to a recommendation from the climate assembly. Um, and so we just want to make sure we do our due diligence. So um, that is all what we're aiming to do tomorrow, but definitely within the week, um, we'll be sending out the final list of recommendations as well. Um, if I may, we really... I'm sorry, I, I just um, wanted to add that Mike touched on something that I think you might all be interested in. When you get the results, you will be able to see to what extent there was support how many members supported this, supported each recommendation. So it won't simply be an up and down. There'll be actually, there'll be analytics there that I think you might find interesting. Uh, and I'll, I'll add that. I see Ed has his hand up. Yeah, uh, also just to keep in mind, uh, in general, nothing will come out as a recommendation unless it's got a significant supermajority and that's part of all the formulas that Mike and his team are going to have to work through. Uh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, it, this is all coming back. The, the other interesting thing is that the way they're voting is they're not voting up and down. They're voting, they're voting on things, on options. I really like this. I support it, but I have reservations. You know, I, my reservations are significant, but not enough to oppose this, et, et cetera. So you're really going to get a read of how people feel about these recommendations. The classic seven point Likert scale. Yes, <laughs> I think that, that I, I really do appreciate the process so much. Do we have any other questions? I see the link to the UK assembly website is in the chat. And so if somebody has another question, here I am blinded by the light. It's probably a metaphor. And uh, if you can put them in the chat, we'll take those and then uh, and then we'll let you scoot on to your next not as much fun meeting. I'm not seeing anything else in the chat. I just want to thank all of the presenters. You you must know participants, how much effort it takes to get this many people with this much knowledge and this much commitment together Friday morning, 8 a.m. Bless your hearts. Thank you so much for this morning. Um, we'll, yeah. we'll see you online. Up. Senator Lovelet is, has a hand up. Oh, great, great. Senator Lovell has a question. Hey, I just wanted to comment. Thanks for organizing this today. I'm glad to be here with you all. The importance of having citizen advocacy around climate policy can't be uh, overstated. So thank you for taking the time this morning. And between this slate of legislators here, um, I see Rep Dewar and Rep Rammel. Um, there's a lot of really exciting climate policy in the legislature that's running right now. And we need your advocacy right now to help some of these bills continue to move um, because we need to have that, that external pressure pressure on making sure that we're continuing to underscore the urgency of climate action. Uh, so please make sure you're checking out all of our web pages and um, signing in to testify for different proposals. There's a lot out there um, that we should be excited about. Uh, so anyway, thanks again. Thank you so much. I see we're at 8.56. So whoever, whoever has the button, um, we'll, we'll close the meeting, but yes, I really, you know, double down on what, what Senator Lovelet has said. Thank you so much. Ed? Yeah, uh, since we have a few minutes, I'll just go ahead and kind of pose this. So I'm, I'm one of the members of People's Voice on Climate, so we're the ones who initiated the assembly. And um, I really would love to just kind of pose the question out there to the people from the legislature as to what you think the best means might be uh, for the assembly's recommendations to get shared with the legislature. Um, if any of you have anything to say now, that's great. And otherwise, if you think about it and have some thoughts, um, please, please get in touch about that. 
Well, I take a stab at answering that. I mean, I think there's two different phases of legislative process. So right now, what we need is your advocacy on bills that are still moving. And then over the interim is when we can have a chance to actually sit down and really talk to folks about the types of policies we might want to propose in the subsequent legislative session. And then you get a little more time to go more in depth. This time of year, our schedules are just really bonkers. We were, I mean, yesterday was a 16 hour day. Today's probably going to be about the same. Um, so it's a lot harder for us to connect with folks during this time of year. So, you know, if you kind of break your advocacy into two distinct pieces, that really is helpful for us. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. And of course, people are available to answer questions and follow up and, and that will happen. That will happen. Well, thank, thank you, you so all much. so much for coming, <laughs> especially our speakers. I mean, well, everybody, thank you. Okay, so. Thank you uh, so much, Lunal, for moderating this discussion. And thank you so much to all of the presenters who shared their, who shared their knowledge about the climate assembly process and the Washington Climate Assembly. Um, you know, and we also can't thank enough our early champions in the legislature who encouraged us to do this. Very and true. have been with us. Um, uh, and um, Senator Warnick has also been incredibly supportive, which yeah. was, which has been great. Yeah, special thanks to Representative Ryu as one of the initial members who published, uh, co-authored an op-ed uh, to call for a citizens assembly to help address climate um, mitigation. So thank you so much for all of your work. It was my pleasure. Thanks for doing all the heavy lifting, however, you did all the work. <laughs> of course. It's been a, a labor of love. <laughs> yes, you know, in other countries, we are the first Citizens Assembly that's been sponsored by citizens. In other countries, they are convened by the government, mm -hmm. um, which is something for all of you to think about. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, uh, Senator Lovelet, do you have your hand up again? Nope, I think I probably just didn't put it down, but uh, okay. since I have the floor, check out Senate Bill 5373, Washington Strong Act, um, progressive carbon pricing policy to try to essentially enact the Green New Deal. Hearing next Thursday at 8 a.m. Need Thank all you. the testifiers we can get. Excellent. <laughs> Thanks, bye. Well, um, I'm going to um, let you all let you all go and uh, back to your very busy, important work. Thank you again so much for being here today. Um, and thank you so much for Lunell and everyone else who attended. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Hang on one second. Let me stop the recording.